This is flipped mini lecture number 28, and I'm basically going to finish chapter 10. So, where we left it in number 27 was we now know that if you have a potential, potential might even be a function of x, y, and z if this is a three dimensional problem. We now know that you can get f sub x, the x component of the force that's associated with this potential, by taking minus du dx. And similarly, if this is a three-dimensional problem, uh, you can get fy by taking minus du dy, and you can take fz by taking the derivative of u with respect to z. Now, mathematicians actually, even though this totally makes sense, the way I've written it, when a, there's multiple variables in a problem, x, y, and z, and when you can take the derivative with respect to any of those variables, they actually use a different symbol. They don't use the letter d anymore. They use this funny sim symbol like that, that's sort of a stylized D. And then instead of saying du dx, they say the partial derivative of u with respect to x, or the partial derivative of u with respect to y, or the partial derivative of u with respect to z. And what they mean by that is that you're taking a derivative with respect to x here while pretending that y and z are constants. Or here, you're taking a derivative with respect to y while pretending that x and z are constants. And finally down here, you're taking a derivative with respect to z while pretending that x and y are constants. So I've shown you how to get fx, fy, and fz. If you go to Knight, equation 10.26, he actually shows you how to get something that he calls f sub s. And he says that's equal to minus du ds. And this is the derivative of u in the direction that the particle's going, and this is the amount of force in the direction the particle is going. And I'd encourage you, if you actually understood the, how to get fx, fy, and fz, uh, read the proof, 10.23, 10.24, 10.25, and 10.26, so that you know what night means by this. Because this tells you how to get the change in u with respect to s in any direction. Ah, heck, I'll show you. Uh, if I have a path and it goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 meters, okay? So there's 0 meters, 1, 2, 3 meters, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 meters. And I have a potential that's defined everywhere in space, including, of course, along this path. Well, then I can take, do this. Let's say I'm considered the point three meters. I can go, what's u at three meters? What's u at th the, when I'm three meters along the path? And I call this measurement along the path, I call it s. So I'm saying, what's u of s when s equals three meters? That's saying, what is u at the value 3 meters? And then I can do this. I can make this combination. I can make u at s plus delta s minus u at s, and then divide that by delta s. So uh, you want to make that a little more concrete, just like I was making it more concrete here. You could have delta s be uh, 0.1 meters. So this says, what's u at 3.1 meters? Okay, which would be right there. What's u at 3 meters? So now you take u at 3.1 meters and you subtract off u at 3 meters and then divide by 0.1 meters. And if you do that with a really small amount, like what's u at 3.01 meters? Or what's u at 3 meters plus just one millimeter? What's u at 3.001 meters? minus u at 3 meters, Mu divide that by 0 0.001 meters. If you take the limit that delta s goes to 0 of that, 
that's what we mean by d u d s. So now you know how to interpret the right hand side of this equation. You have to know how u varies with the position on the path, and then you take the derivative of u with respect to that, then you multiply by minus 1, and that gives you the component of the force in the direction of the path. Okay, so on to the next thing. I'm still trying to clean up loose ends from chapter 10. So here's something. Suppose you have a situation like this. Here's your x-axis and here's your y-axis. And suppose you start off at 0, 0. And then you go to the point A0. And then maybe from there to there, you go to the point A comma B. So this is x. This is y, you've gone over a, and then you've gone up b. Now you could calculate if there's some force field here, let's say, that's acting on a particle as it moves through these points. You could calculate the work along this path. And you could calculate the work along that path. And let's call the work that you calculate along this path, let's call that w1. And you could calculate the work that you calculated along that path. You could call that W2. And then if someone said, what's the total work done on the particle if it went from, from here to here by first going to here and then going to there, you'd say, well, the total work done on the particle is W1 plus W2. But of course, I could have gone up first to the point 0 comma B. And then I could have gone over to the point A comma B. So that's a totally legitimate different way of getting from 0, 0 to A, B. And so I could calculate the work going that way. And this, this would be W3, and that would be W4. And the force might be something completely different over there. Here it seems like the force was, I don't know, kind of pointing inward. Maybe over here uh, the force mostly points outward. I don't know. I'm making it up. Force field can be whatever force field is. So whatever you get for work sub 3 and work sub 4 is whatever you get for work sub 3 and work sub 4. So now you've got a new way of calculating the work of getting from 0, 0 to AB. And the fact is, it's only dumb luck, it would seem, if the total work getting from 0, 0 to A, B going this way would is equal to the total work going from 0, 0 to A, B going this way. In other words, this might equal that or it might not equal that. But it turns out that for a load of forces in physics, they do equal. For a load of forces, it turns out that it doesn't matter how you get from 0, 0 to A, B, the force does the same amount of work. And we have a force for which that's always true, a force for which it just flat out doesn't care about the path. We call that a conservative force. And for some forces in physics, the force isn't conservative. And we call those non-conservative forces. So um, one of the things you'll get good at towards the end of chapter 10 is uh, calculating how to get the work done by a couple of different paths and being able to answer what the question of is that consistent with it being a conservative force? Or can you already see that it's not a conservative force? Well, um, that's 10.7, by the way, if you want to read about how Knight talks about conservative and non-conservative forces. And uh, I'm going to let you read 10.8 all on your own. 10.8 is a, a, a little more discussion of energy conservation. And it says that sometimes energy can be added to a system, usually by work being done on it. And sometimes energy can be taken away from a system, oftentimes that's by friction or drag. 
And so he wants to say that, you know, energy is always conserved if you're talking about the complete system, but if some energy enters the system or some energy leaves the system, then we have to modify the equations of conservation of energy a little bit. And I think that's actually fairly obvious how you have to modify them, but if you want to see all that uh, written out, Knight does that on page 251 and 252, which are the last two pages of chapter 10. And in the next lecture, we're going to start momentum conservation, which is chapter 11.